Hi, this is Jared Meyer with the Foundation for Government Accountability, and today we're talking with Chairwoman of the FTC, Maureen Olhausen, about a shared interest of our two organizations, occupational licensing reform. So Chairman Olhausen, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to talk with us today, and I wanted to get an idea of what drew you to occupational licensing reform. Do you have any personal interactions <laughs> with licensing laws, or why, why did you decide to devote so much of your career to fighting this? Well, Jared, thanks so much uh, for coming to talk to me. I'm delighted to talk about one of my favorite topics here. And it really is an outgrowth of my long time interest and support for free markets. Uh, and the idea that uh, someone needs a, a permission slip from the government to perform their job, uh, I found very um, you know, uh, curious. Uh, and as I delved more deeply into it, concerning at times. So certainly uh, justifications for it, but there's way too much of it uh, that's existing that really makes make sense for free markets and for the benefit of consumers. Well, occupational licensing, it's always justified in terms of public safety. If we don't have these restrictions on work, then there's going to be dangers that are posed to the public. Do you have any data or anything to counter this common argument? So that is a common argument. And the fact that the FTC has both consumer protection and competition expertise, I think, makes us perfectly positioned to talk about it. Because we do care about consumers. And we care about safety. We care about their well-being. But so many of these licenses are not based on justifiable health and safety concerns. So one of the data points that I look to is the fact that there are about 60 occupations that are licensed in every state. But there are over 1,100 occupations that have a license in at least one state. So that, that's kind of a, a very wide swing between those two, those two areas. So I think that's, that's one of the data points. If you have states, many states that don't require an occupational license to practice this, I think that gives you an idea that maybe it really isn't health or safety related. And oftentimes, it's kind of obvious on their face. When we're looking at things that involve floral design, uh, interior decorating, hair braiding, it's so obvious that there really isn't a health or safety um, a nexus to that. Yeah, and I've even seen on the local level, cities like Detroit, they license 60 additional occupations. So 30 of those, the city or the state of Michigan doesn't license at all, yet Detroit decides to license them, and 30 other ones, they have higher standards. So when we throw in city and local or county level occupational licensing on top of states, it's really high barriers to work for a lot of people. And what role do you think the FTC plays in this? Why, why is this agency the one that's designed to focus on occupational licensing instead of all the other alphabet soup of government agencies we have here in DC? So I think there's a twofold reason. I mentioned our consumer protection expertise and our antitrust expertise, but we also have a policy making role. And that is really where this was an outgrowth of. So we've got um, a competition advocacy program that I used to head. And we have filed hundreds of comments with state and uh, local officials and sometimes municipal level officials about uh, whether we think the regulation, the occupational license they're proposing is really good for consumers. So I think uh, that's been a very important reason why the FTC has been involved. But we've also been able to back it up in certain areas with enforcement in the antitrust area where you've got basically a board that's made up of um, self-interested parties, active market participants, who are imposing this obligation on anyone else who's going to come in and, and challenge their place in the market. I call it the brother may I problem. Right? So we often think about government regulation being this mother may I. Uh, but when you've got competitors actually controlling market access, that creates this brother may I problem. And it, uh, at, under certain circumstances, the FTC has been able to bring an enforcement action. So from what I understand, a uh, Supreme Court case from two years ago, North Carolina Dental Board yes. uh, versus the FTC, that's actually what gave the FTC a stronger role in policing state level occupational licenses. Could you go a little bit into why that Supreme Court case was so important and what it means for the future of occupational licensing? Absolutely. So we, folk, we um, are in a federal system, right? So we've got the federal government and the state governments. And I definitely respect the state's ability to, to regulate, to act in this space. But what the Supreme Court said is it actually has to be the action of the state itself. It can't be that private actors have just taken on this cloak of state authority to restrict competition for their own benefit. And that's what the North Carolina dental case at the Supreme Court really clarified. The idea that you need um, active supervision by the state when you have active market participants making these kinds of decisions. The other prong of the state action approach is that it has to be clearly articulated policy by the state 
to displace competition. And we got that through two Supreme Court cases, one called Phoebe Putney and then the North Carolina dental case you just mentioned. So from what I understand, the, uh, that Supreme Court case was about a bunch of dentists who wanted to now make those teeth whiteners you'd see in the mall go through a whole dental licensing process. Is that correct? That's correct. And this case was a very important one. Uh, it, it was kind of the outgrowth of a lot of policy work that we had done to, to uh, develop where we thought the law should go. And then this case was an opportunity to actually bring it to fruition. And so we had this opportunity where the State Board of Dentists had decided that uh, tooth whiteners needed to also have dental licenses. And they actually went out and contacted um, uh, malls and other uh, shopping centers and said, oh, you can't have these tooth whiteners in here. Uh, there, that's the unauthorized practice of dentistry. And so it was one of those things where we said, look, there's not really uh, a health or safety requirement. Almost all other states, I think 48, you know, 49 other states, permitted tooth whitening without any kind of license. So it was a, kind of one of those very clear examples. That, and the state itself wasn't actively supervising this board of dentists, who I believe were acting in their own um, economic interests. Uh, the, the FTC playing a role can help rebalance that, but also just making state officials aware of this dynamic. Just because someone is coming in and saying, oh, you know, all of us, you know, uh, florists have gotten together and we want to have a license, you know, think about that. Is that really good, good for consumers? Yeah, is there a reason we need people taking like two flowers, putting them together and selling it? Is there a reason we need them to have a license? Exactly, exactly. And I know in Louisiana, the pass rate for the Louisiana florist exam is half that of the pass rate for the Louisiana bar exam. So it's twice as hard to become a florist as it is to become a lawyer. That doesn't That's, seem to make much sense. Right, and when you think about the, the harm, the possible harm to the public, um, look, if you don't like the flower arrangement, just don't buy it there. And all the online platforms that we have now for reviews, for someone to say, you know, that shop, you know, doesn't do good work, their, their flower arrangements are ugly, or they're, you know, uh, not on time, or something like that. It's very easy for consumers and the market to sort these things out, compared to something like um, the practice of medicine. We say, well, the consumer doesn't have that type of information. It's very difficult for them to, to sort those things out. And huge health and safety implications. Licensing makes sense there. It doesn't make sense in, the, in those other cases. Yeah, with technology, we've seen consumers have access to unprecedented levels of information, everything from Google reviews mm -hmm. to Angie's List to Yelp. Exactly. All these services weren't available just you know a few decades ago. But what we've seen is occupational licensing has grown from something that one in every 20 Americans has had to do back in the 1960s to now six in every 20 Americans. Yes. That's a massive increase at the exact same time as we would expect licensing to become less prevalent because of the information that consumers now have. What do you think the role of technology will play in, as uh, policymakers try to understand how to best create an occupational licensing framework? I hope that they'll understand that. I you know, talked about free, the free market, kind of what brought me to this. And market forces and technology can play a role in sharpening those market forces by putting more information in, into the marketplace, more forms, new forms of competition, better competition into the marketplace that um, state officials think about how competition can provide these benefits, quality assurance to consumers, price competition, availability, all the kinds of things that we, we want to see consumers get through a market and say, well, before we interfere with the market's ability to do that, is it really, really necessary? Is this going to be a better outcome for consumers? Uh, let me mention a case that actually preceded the North Carolina dental case. It was a South Carolina dental. It ended up being a settlement. But that was a case where, uh, in the state of South Carolina, the state had changed its laws to allow um, dental hygienists to go and screen poor children in schools, give them a cleaning, give them a, a fluoride treatment. And the dental board went and uh, enacted an emergency regulation that said, no, 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 it has to be dentists that oversee that and dentists that do that. So that was another area where you had a, a licensed profession of the, um, the dental hygienists who were perfectly capable and qualified to provide this level of care. But you had the, the dentists who had the higher license coming in and using the state, um, the state regulatory apparatus to fence out those competitors. 
That's a crazy story because the, the lawmakers passed an explicit bill saying this should be allowed, yet the board, because they've grown so unaccountable or almost feeling as if they can do whatever they want, stepped in to take away care from needy students. I, I yes. find examples like that just crazy. Yeah, the facts uh, you know, uh, were uh, very uh, appealing for our, for our side and eventually did settle settle the case because it was like the poorest children who needed this kind of screening in school and they weren't getting the care that they needed and it had a, a big impact uh, on their on their health. I've also noticed on the FTC's website you've now created an economic liberty task force. Uh, could you talk a little bit about why you're excited about this and what it means for the FTC to be using the bully pulpit and really <laughs> being a public advocate for competition and for freeing up opportunity? I'm, del I'm delighted to talk about this. This is my first project as the acting chairman was to announce uh, the Economic Liberty Task Force because I think we're at a great um, we have a great opportunity to work with states and other policymakers to try to move economic liberty forward, to try to reduce some of these government barriers to job growth, to competition, to en enhance consumer services. So we are working with states. Uh, to identify these kinds of regulations to say don't enact them or get rid of them or you know have them be targeted appropriately. Uh, so I want to be um, a, a resource for states because we have a lot of expertise uh, in, this, in this field. Yeah, and I've seen some promising movements in states like Tennessee, Arizona, Michigan, Delaware. I mean, the, the list goes on. There's definitely a growing momentum for occupational licensing reform. And what advice as a policymaker would you give state-level policymakers as they try to tackle this challenge? Because as we talked about, it's going to be difficult. There's going to be a lot of special interests. Mm -hmm. They're going to get a lot of pushback. How can they best message that we need increased opportunity through decreased levels of licensing? So I think the best way for them to do it is first cast a kind of skeptical eye over new proposals for, for, um, for licensing and say, well, is this really related to health and safety? Is this something we need? And then if it is related to that and we need it, is it stricter than it needs to be? Again, going back to the example of allowing the hygienists to you know, examine uh, you know, poor children's teeth. Do we really need the, you know, a dentist to do that versus a hygienist or cat? Or, for example, in, in other settings, like allowing the nurse practitioner to practice in the big box retailer to, to give the, you know, the ear, you know, you've got an earache, you need a flu shot, things like, things like that. So I think that's important. And there is some evidence out there about the benefits to consumers of allowing this type of um, uh, competition to flourish. So I think that they could, they could draw upon that. Um, also, the FTC website has a lot of research uh, on these topics that they can draw upon about the benefits to competition, to consumers, uh, and what other states have done in, in this field. So I think uh, as, they're, as they're working through these issues, please, they should consider the FTC to be a partner and a resource in this.